appeared before the Congressional Committee to tell what I knew of activities which might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. President Bush signed a formal agreement that will end the United States as we know it. And he took the step without approval from either the U.S. Congress or the people of the United States. The secret organizations of the world power elite are no longer secret. It's known as the Bilderberg Group. Could their objective be world domination? I'm Jim Tucker. I've chased Bilderberg for 30 years. I'll never give up the chase. Bilderberg plan for the whole world is nothing less than world government. I'm not comfortable with that at all. Who elected these guys to run the planet? They are the elitists. They feel they should run the world for their own selfish interests. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. Bilderberg is making great progress toward a world government, and only an educated, informed public can stop them in their tracks. David Rockefeller admits in his own memoirs that he wants to destroy the United States. Right. He's a traitor! It's good to be back at the Council on Foreign Relations. As uh, Pete mentioned, I've been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories. Well, the reason I bring it up, if you've ever heard any of our call-in shows, you know that we have people that uh, think about the conspiracy theories mm -hmm. of people like you. Uh, you would be a poster child for these people because you have served on the board of the Council on Foreign Relations. You started, helped start the Trilateral Commission, and you've been to the Bilderberger Group. Too, are people too close in this world, uh, people in business, too close to the, the governments? Well, you know, there, there is such a thing as insidious influence. And the question is, how does it operate? Does it involve bribery? And does it involve some sort of psychological domination of individuals? I don't believe in this notion of some sort of secret societies controlling people. But of course, in any political system, there are sort of over the table and under the table arrangements. The new world order was on display with the first Gulf War and the creation of a European Union. After losing to his crony Bill Clinton, he faded into the background as the agenda for a new world order marched forward. Whenever these agendas were threatened, those who opposed them ended up dead. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. Thank you very much. I wrote a paper about all three of the big assassinations in the 60s, which was John F. Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. And there are certain common denominators. I call these events deep events. We've become accustomed to the idea that every now and then something is going to happen, and we just know from the beginning we're not going to get to the bottom of it. And the more they happen, the more uh, reconciled we become to this state of affairs. In 1978, the House Select Committee on Assassinations could not ignore there was a conspiracy in regards to the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Good evening. A congressional committee has concluded that President John Kennedy and civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr., both of them, were probably killed as the result of conspiracies. 
The House Assassinations Committee wound up its two-year study by recommending that the Justice Department look into both cases. In the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, the committee concluded the likelihood of conspiracy. The committee's summary of findings says President Kennedy was probably assassinated as a result of a conspiracy, that its evidence establishes a high probability that two gunmen fired at the motorcade. The committee concluded that President Kennedy did not receive adequate Secret Service protection in Dallas, that the CIA was deficient in sharing information before and after, that the Justice Department and Warren Commission failed to pursue possible conspiracies and made their conclusions too definite. There seems to be no debate that the CIA and Secret Service were involved in the assassination. As you can clearly see, two Secret Service agents being taken away from their positions at the back of Kennedy's vehicle just moments before the assassination. And no matter what you believe about Oswald, it has now been declassified that Oswald was trained by the CIA in 1957 under the cover of the Office of Naval Intelligence. Assassination is an option when the ruling class can identify an enemy who cannot be compromised. But how do they bend the population's will to do their bidding? Well, the false flag operation is one in which the attacker carries the flag of someone else. It's usually a military operation, and the purpose, of course, is to create the uh, uh, impression that the attacker is someone else. They want to create negative public opinion against the nation whose flag was being used. Um, or they may even not use a flag at all. This sort of thing is done all the time, and uh, it's certainly not unique in history. I think we've been seeing a lot of it lately. Americans are easily motivated by false flag operations, and uh, I think it's inevitable that we will see false flag operations in the near future. It is used in order to seize power at an accelerated pace. The government has lied about 9-11 repeatedly and used it to dominate the Middle East while creating an evolving police state here, encroaching on civil liberties at home. And of course, building a new world order. There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used, I think only once, and hasn't been used since, and that is a new world order. We know now that September 11th of 2001 was the beginning of what we might call a new world order. The new world order that uh, uh, this president's uh, father talked about with such great enthusiasm seems to be high on the agenda of this administration. Under the second Bush administration, massive amounts of civil liberties were openly and brazenly taken away following 9-11. The passage of the Patriot Acts, the Military Commissions Act, and other horrifying anti-constitutional legislation was enabled by the incredible amount of fear generated by the media, all in the name of keeping us safe here at home. The war itself would create huge profits for the military industrial complex, and the globalists would seize even more power and control over Middle Eastern resources in what they planned to become a Eurasian Union under their control. Although the establishment claimed to be fighting for our freedom abroad, they were destroying our sovereignty by stealth. Expanding on NAFTA, they were able to consolidate power on the domestic front, by deindustrializing the United States through CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, as well as the SPP, the Securities and Prosperity Partnership. Opponents, however, say the initiative is nothing less than a plan to create a North American Union that would eliminate sovereignty for all three nations. Building on the North American Free Trade Agreement, the NAFTA section of the Commerce Department is busy drafting laws and regulations for a North American Union a union of Canada, America, and Mexico. The president has attended secret meetings and signed at least two agreements under the Security and Prosperity Partnership Program. The stated goal established by Presidents Bush, Fox, and Prime Minister Paul Martin is integration by 2010. That's a plan from the business elites, the political elites, that will cost more American jobs, cost American sovereignty, but it would fulfill the president's father's vision. Now former United States Trade Ambassador Robert Zolik is talking about it again with renewed vigor. This time a new world order with business at the helm of trade and economic policy. It's an agenda that goes hand in hand with the United States, Mexico and Canada working quietly and behind the scenes to promote a common market with common deregulation for the benefit of multinational corporations. It's remarkable to me the arrogance, the, the idea of just simply 
throwing away the nation's sovereignty, but they're trying to do so in so many ways. People better understand that they mean exactly what they're saying. It's a new world order they're trying to create. Dobbs, the only mainstream anchor to expose the new world order, resigned shortly after bullets were fired into his home. The elite do not plan on waiting around for these unions to be formed before implementing the next step in global government. Through the vast global economic crisis of the last few years, they have been able to devalue the dollar and undermine it as the world's reserve currency. They have allowed the Federal Reserve and IMF to consolidate power by taking control of the Securities and Exchange Commission, as well as issuing a global currency instead of the dollar disguised as a special drawing rights unit. This aspect of the New World Order was announced at the G20 in April of 2009. There is a big thing that's going to happen in London at this G20, and then they're hiding it, they're camouflaging it, they're not talking about it. Coordination of international regulation. Mm -hmm. What they are going to do is to put our Fed and our SEC under the control, in effect, of the IMF. The New World Order, that's what they're, they're planning in there, is, is to um, undermine the U.S. currency, and it's just... It's just really sad. What it really is, is putting the American economy under international regulation. Yeah. And those people who have been yelling, oh, the UN's going to take over global conspiracy government. Conspiracy theorists. They conspir they've been crazy, but now they they're right. There's 20 or whatever people in the G20, say there's 20 ministers, thousands of us, and we can't get our voices heard. When Ga Geithner said he would be open to the idea of a global currency last exactly. week, yeah. th those conspiracy people had said and suggested that for That's years. Right. You're not wrong. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweigh the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting...